Okay. Hello and welcome. I'm Bernadette Schwert. I'm from Secrets of Aussie Online Entrepreneurs and I have with me today Sean O'Brien from Selby Acoustics. So welcome, Sean. Thank you very much for joining me. Yeah, it's my pleasure anytime. Now Sean, I've invited you on to speak today because you were one of those early eBay success stories, I believe, and I was just wondering if you could maybe tell us how you got what is Selby Acoustics and how did you get it started? Um, okay, well, Selby Acoustics sells home theatre, um, predominantly online, but we also have two retail stores now as well. started in 2003. Um, I worked in retail my whole life and, and I really wanted to get into my own business and quite honestly, eBay seemed to be the best option. There was virtually zero cost to market, 2003, almost no competition and, um, and it just seemed like the way to go. So I, I, I guess I researched eBay for about six months and then, uh, then jumped in and it all sort of took off from there. Right, so I remember reading that you were selling cables from home but obviously there's a big jump from, well is there, is there a big jump from selling cables, you know, from you know, your spare room into an eBay store and then further into you've got a bricks and mortar store, haven't you? So tell us a little bit about that journey, what that required to go from one level to the next. Um, look, just a, a lot of work, a lot of work and a lot of work really. Um, basically, I guess I was, I, I say I'm lucky but a lot of people disagree. Um, I, I just really worked my bum off and um, at the time I was working full time as well so I, I didn't need to create a business immediately that I needed to survive off so every piece of profit was able to be reinvested into more stock, more product and, and building the business I guess for the first two years. Um, which That made it easier and it also made it harder because it was trying to juggle two things at once. But uh, it, look, growth just continued and uh, I was used to managing staff so as needed I'd put staff on and then really customer demand created the stores. Uh, people want to come and have a look and, and touch and feel the products and, and so the stores just started off just as um, part of the, the warehouse, so to speak, the, the showroom on the warehouse and then we opened the store in Geelong which is going quite nicely and we've just moved the, the main store uh, in our existing warehouse to a new standalone store of 12,000 square metres, um, which is oh, 1,200 square metres I should say, uh, which is going really nicely as well. Excellent. So when you're starting out, Sean, what were some of the challenges that you recall? I mean, it was a while back now, but what, what do you remember thinking, this is really hard, I wish I had help with this? Um, well, I guess my biggest challenges were there was absolutely no, well, I had zero capital. I started the business with $100, uh, bought $100 worth of stock and I've, I've never invested any, of, any other money in it at all since then. Um, so doing everything on a very tight budget was always tough. I had no experience online, my computer skills were, were almost zero and finding suppliers was incredibly difficult. Um, in 2003 you know, the internet was uh, almost a dirty word as far as uh, traditional retail was concerned and getting suppliers was near on impossible. So that, that was just persistence really, keep collecting those until, until we found suppliers we could work with and gradually as we showed success with one supplier another one would come on board. It's funny you should say that, Sean, because I just spoke with Kate Morris from adorebeauty.com.au and she said exactly the same. She sells beauty products and she was saying at the beginning she had two products and a website and, but no big brands wanted to be involved because they couldn't see why. Yeah, there was no reason but then she got two more. Then she went back to those who said no and they said, oh, well, now you've got four. Well, I might come on. So is that sort of the principle yep. that you use, that little bit of success led to the next success? That exactly is, is what happened. Um, Although some of the bigger brands that we really wanted to deal with uh, continued to say no for a long time, which was kind of a blessing in disguise. Um, I Why was that? Fell into doing, well, I kind of fell into doing the accessories because no one would sell me the electronics. <laughs> um, everybody wants to sell the bright, the bright shiny, fun thing. Yeah. Um, but it was easy enough for me to get the, the, um, the accessories, which turned out way better because um, part of my strategy from the start was fantastic customer service and with electronics that just would not have been possible. Um, the, the low margins and the costs involved with providing good service of electronics is not possible to really provide great service in that industry. Yeah, or even all the servicing of those components. Correct, and problems and faults. So I really started looking at products that um, the inherent nature of the product meant that they provided good service by themselves. They didn't break, they didn't have damage, they were easy to use. Uh, if one went missing, it was easy to replace and cost-effective to replace and that sort of thing. 
I think that's a really interesting point you make there, Sean, because it was almost through default you couldn't get the suppliers to back you, so you went down a different tack, and as it turned out, that was absolutely the right tack to go down in terms of all the reasons you just outlined. So it was almost like through default you found your business. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Fantastic. So when you... Um, you see online entrepreneurs start up now, and obviously that was 2003, we're now we're 12 years down the track. What do you think are some of the key hang-ups or big issues that they face getting, on, getting started in your experience? Competition now. Yep. Um, absolutely competition. Um, the, as much as everybody says it's not, the internet really is, if you're selling a commodity-based product, it's a, it's a race to the bottom in price, and whoever's the cheapest is going to be the most successful. So. Um, competition by far is the biggest challenge, um, and you know, creating some sort of a unique point of difference in in, the, in either what you're selling or how you sell it um, to stand out from that crowd. Right, and I inter interviewed uh, Rosalind Kogan recently, and he obviously uh, competes on price, and he's very clear about that. Very, very strong USP. So, is that your USP, your service, aren't you? Um, well, yeah, initially, yes. Uh, so when I first started, uh, everywhere you looked online, it was uh, there was everybody would have a list of rules of what people had to do before they were allowed to buy off you, and it was just it didn't make sense to me. So um, I, I sort of saw online as different. I saw it saw it as still a retail service industry, but providing a service is harder because you don't have the person in front of you. It's harder to communicate by email, all those sort of things. Um, so I tried to anticipate the problems and, and tried to create better service, and I think that still stands us in good stead from uh, particularly on eBay. You know, uh, we've got uh, tremendous feedback on eBay, um, and it, and it does help us with sales. Whether whether service is important online to get the initial transaction, no, I don't think it is. The ability to provide good service when something goes wrong, I think, is critically important. That, that's, that's a good point. So how do you actually get that first customer over the line if you can't demonstrate your service but, and also your price, I'm not suggesting this is you, but your price is maybe not the bottom. How, how do you get that first customer over the line so that they can experience your service? Sometimes it's credibility just through the, the look and feel of your site. So if we take eBay out of the case, um, so we would get a lot more sales off eBay because of our service because it's very prevalent, eBay tells everybody what your service is like. Yeah, yeah. Um, being found, uh, I mean, is number one. If you take eBay, even these days it's hard to get found on eBay. Um, but if you can't get found for a start through Google or some other type of marketing, then you're not getting the sale. Once you've got them to the site, if the site's professional, uh, laid out nicely, um, and has credibility, when I buy credibility, I mean, if you're a guy at home selling four different cables, just your range doesn't have credibility. Yeah. Having four thousand different cables and being able to tell everybody in your copy what they do, um, that does have credibility. So you don't always need to be the cheapest, but you need to still have what I call the perception of cheap. So you need those lost leaders yep. and in a way to convert those leaders into a, into a better product. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So, um, Sean, in terms of someone who's got an idea for a business but not quite sure how they uh, should proceed, how can they research it to make sure that they're not investing money in, in, a, in, a, in a dog, so to speak, if I can use that terminology? I, I guess um, first step would be to, if, if it's obviously an online business selling products, obviously Google the products um, and you know, see what competition is out there with the amount of paid advertising that's already there. Look on eBay. eBay is whether you want to sell on eBay or not. It's a good benchmark of what your price point needs to be to be able to successfully sell that product online at all. Because mm. um, if you're just doing a standalone a standalone website, eBay is going to be your biggest competitor no matter what. Mm. Um, particularly in Australia, when Amazon comes along, it will be as well. Um, so you know, being able to be price competitive, you've either got to be super price competitive if you're selling the same brands and products that everybody else is selling, mm -hmm. or you've got to have a really good point of difference, um, a product that nobody else can get or does get, such as what shoes are prey to, where they custom make all their own shoes. Right, right. So and this is a hard question to answer probably, but are there any niches left? You know, I think a lot of people think, I'd love to sell X, Y, Z, but they think, look, People can get it from China. They can get it from Alibaba for you know a cent. So how can I possibly make a buck out of that, Sean? Do you see any niches that are yet to be tapped? 
I can't think of any off the top of my head, and if I did, I probably wouldn't. You wouldn't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> It'd be the next thing we'd be going into. So yeah, sure. I'd have to kill you. Sure. Um, but um, look, there is. There's hundreds of them. Uh, I mean, two years ago, nobody was selling bike parts online. Now all the big successful guys were selling push bikes. Um, yeah. It's it's the, the online market. It's you just got to watch what's happening with fashion and. Um, and by fashion, I don't mean clothing. I just mean what's popular. Everybody's into cycling at the moment. All of a sudden, cycling websites are going crazy. Yeah. Um, if everyone, you know, if um, Pilates becomes a craze again, Pilates-based websites are going to become really popular again. It's um, you just got to see what's out there in the marketplace. It's uh, that you know something about and that you're passionate about. And and I think there's a market for everything still. Um, mm, mm. And there's there's new websites coming into markets that you think are saturated and, and smashing it just because they do something different. It might be the colour of their buttons people like better or you know, the ones that are really successful at the moment are spending millions on advertising, so that doesn't help. So yeah. Help a startup person anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sean, in terms of building a list, um, you've got obviously you know hundreds of thousands of customers, I would imagine. Um, what do you suggest to someone starting out who's got you know, ten names on a list. How can they quickly grow their list? Well, there's a couple of ways you can buy it, but that's just a, I think it's a waste of money because it's not qualified traffic. Um, I think if you've got your site up and running and you want to start building a mailing list in particular, you've got to give something away. It's the only yep. way to build it quickly: it's either yep. a discount or a prize or a, um, a monthly draw or whatever it is. Um, every time we do something like that, we we build our list by another thousand in a month easily. Um, that's just consistency, um, right? And then doing something to when you and, and once you've got that list, you've got to be generating. I think you've got to be generating ninety percent content, one percent selling, and nine percent of fluff. Um, yep. Because if all you're doing is throwing out day after day another special, another special, you, your unsubscribe rate is going to be as high as your subscribe rate. Yep. Um, whereas we do. Um, we do an, a, a newsletter a week, but we would be lucky to offer a product a month. Yeah. Um, and then when we do a big promotion, like every every now and then, like, was it last Melbourne Cup Day we were closed because of the public holiday, so we did like a 15% off offer that went out to our list, and we did something like 22 times the normal day sales. Wow. Wow. Because when we do an offer, when we do an offer, it has credibility because we don't very often do. We're not just shoving product down people's throat all the time. Yeah, yeah. And just on that, in terms of testing, uh, why did you pick? Did you say fifteen percent? Why that? Did you test other percentages? We've done ten before, and we've done twenty before. Um, twenty really worked well, but it was just a. a a lot of you know, it's it, every percent you take off is like ten times the amount of sales you've got to generate to, to pay for it. Um, Fifteen is just over a, a bit of testing where it's sort of we found it's had a good result without being too much off. Yeah, it's just a slight you know the normal thing is ten percent, so that becomes standard. So fifteen is just that little bit extra, which makes people think that's worthwhile, you know, doing it now. Just yeah, in terms, we've done done done. 10% off ones and had not much more than a normal day's trade out of it. And right. Given away to, you know. Yeah, exactly. So with your newsletter, can you tell us a little bit about how you, what, what are the key components of your newsletter that really works? Um, what we try to do as much as we can with our newsletter is we do, um, if we, if, uh, we would do a lot of how to, you know, how to use, how to install a TV on the wall, how to mount speakers out into the El Fresco area, or how to use the amplifier you've already got to get an extra zone if you want music in another area. They're always very, very popular, um, and they always get a really high click-through rate. Um, and then yeah, there's marketing on those, but I, I, it's sort of indirect marketing. It might be on the the bottom of the article. These are the type of products we've mentioned, that sort of thing, rather than just throwing. We've got this on special for ten dollars off. Type of thing. And I see that you've got free Australia-wide shipping there, Sean. 
let's let's talk just a little bit about shipping and the the pros and cons of doing it for free versus um, you know charging. Any thoughts on what people should be aiming at? Depends on the um, <clears throat> once again. It depends on the size of the product and it depends on the industry you're trying to go into. Um, we did not go free shipping by choice. We went through necessity uh, um, because we are fairly eBay. Um, Dependent at the moment, like eBay is still about 35 to 40 percent of our total business. Um, eBay is just everything's going to free shipping. You get rewarded in search, all this sort of, sort, of, sort of stuff for free shipping. And all of our competitors had already done it six months beforehand, and we were starting to see our sales suffer a little bit because of the free shipping. Uh, so we kind of had to go to it because it's all of our industry is doing it. Um, if you're in an industry that's not doing it, I recommend not doing it. It is a nightmare, and it yes, our sales went up, but not as much as what it, it would t take to cover our, um, the shipping costs. So our overall profitability went down quite a lot, um, and we're gradually trying to, to creep that back. But we went genuine free shipping. We didn't mark everything up a bit to cover the shipping costs. We actually absorbed it you know, totally, did not change a single price point of the product, and just absorbed all the shipping in. Um, so small products where you can get a flat rate nationwide, Free shipping works pretty well. Once you go into larger products, where in Melbourne it might be seven dollars to deliver to Caratha, it might be one hundred and seventy-seven dollars to deliver, and that's a pretty reasonable example of what I've got in some of our products. It's very difficult to uh, manage your budget and your profitability when you don't know what your costs are going to be. Yeah, yeah. So looking at customer service, Sean, you know you've you've got in your uh, bio, you know. You've, over 500,000 transactions. Now I'm not sure if that's overall or per year. It's a lot, whichever way we look at it. How do you manage customer service when a lot of your business is done online? Any tips for people who've got, you know, substantial volume of traffic but struggling to keep up with questions and complaints and issues and, and uh, all that sort of stuff? Yeah, for a start, you've got to see customer service as an opportunity, not a chore. Um, the people that don't want to do service, which is a lot of, not so much now, but uh, certainly six years ago, seven years ago, everyone was getting to online service online because they didn't want to deal with customers anymore. Um, if you embrace the, the customer service as an opportunity, whether it be from a complaint or just from an inquiry, um, you, you'll just be good at it. Um, you've got to, I guess, my opinion on service is um, you need to do everything that you would do to a person if they were standing in front of you or do for that person if they were standing in front of you, but you've got to do it better because it's harder to communicate. Emails can take get taken out of context and that sort of thing. But we try and set everything up so I always say the best service is no service at all. Um, our, you know, our customers should be able to go onto the site, find out the information they want, order the product, get it quickly, and the product is fine and they have no problem with it. That's the best service you can provide. So your product sourcing is really the first thing you want to do is get your product right and the quality of the product right so that you, just, you don't have these service problems to start with. And then you have your descriptions and your, your information on your page easy to read and understand so that people can understand what the product does. There's no information about the product missing and um, therefore they don't have to ask questions. Um, we the, That figure of 500,000, I think we do about 150 well, we do about 2,000 transactions a week at the moment, so it's about 100,000 transactions a, a year now. Um, and for our online service, we really have one and a half people um, because we don't actually have to do that much. So what you're saying there is that if you, if you put everything online and you get everything right in terms of your content and your conditions and your refunds and what have you, then it minimises the need to have a stack of people behind the phones. Yes, exactly. Um, and interesting, you said the word conditions. Um, a lot of people use terms and conditions on their website. We don't, um, because I think they're just like if you have ten terms and conditions, it's the top ten reasons not to buy. From <laughs> what do you call it? We don't call it anything. We just don't have that page. All right, um, right. Whatever page it's about, like we don't have terms and conditions. The terms are if you buy something, pay for it, we send it to you. Yeah. Um, well, I don't see why people need terms and conditions. I don't understand it. Yeah. Um, I think it's you know if you've got to have it for a legal reason for the type of product, then I say bury it because mm. it's um, it just you know Optus and Telstra have terms and conditions and everyone hates them. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, you're quite right. It, it instantly throws up reasons not to do business with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, just in closing, Sean, you know the uh, the high speed broadband is coming. Um, wondering what implications that might have for you or, and whether you think this could be an opportunity for, for online entrepreneurs or, or not. I, I, I really do. Um, I've been thinking about this a little bit, actually. And um, one thing I really dislike about it is it's going to homes first and there's just it's not going to the industrial areas and the, and the business parks and that, that where we could utilise it more effectively to, to provide better service. Um, but that aside, the, the opportunity with the customer is the, the, the opportunity for delivering rich content in your marketing, whether it be on your website or in your emails or whatever it might be. When I first started putting things on eBay, um, we, try, you, we tried to keep Images, for instance, are a really good example. Between two to three hundred pixels square, just to make the page load faster. Um, today, a, a two to three hundred pixel image is so far below standard; it's not fun. Um, so you know the benchmark is around about you know, people are looking at sixteen hundred pixel square now as the benchmark, and say, well, that's only you know, five times bigger. It's not; it's twenty eight times the, the data. Um, and it's loading faster now than ever than, than an old 300 pixel photo used to eight years ago. So when the MBN rolls out, how quickly are we going to be able to de deliver video or super rich high res images and that sort of thing? I think that's a big opportunity. And looking at you know, some of the big Im Im products, it absolutely does. Um, and being able to respond to that and deliver that really high quality imaging or video or whatever it might be via the MBN, I think it's going to be incredibly important. Excellent. Great. Well, Sean, thank you so much for sharing your insights and wisdom today. It's been really interesting hearing you speak and some lovely tips, some little tips that you know, I think a lot of people may not have considered. So thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Okay. No problem at all. Anytime. Thanks.